ever heard the phrase, you're ruining it for everyone? Sometimes that can be true, especially in the spiritual realm. Even though you and I didn't exist when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned in the Garden of Eden, what Adam did, did in fact ruin it for everyone. You may wonder, how did Adam's disobedience ruin it for an entire human race? Well, Pastor Woods explains that and how another man's act of obedience brings restoration to the human race in his sermon titled, An Adam in Christ. Taken from Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Turn me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're in verses 12 to 21. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if, if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through the one act of righteousness there re resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Amen. That as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You may be seated. We are going through this book of Romans, and I must admit that this particular portion and passage of Scripture is a very important piece. Not like all of them are not important, but this passage we just read, verses 12 to 21, pretty much describes and also shows you and I the power of sin and its effect upon the human race and also the power of God's saving grace to the human race through Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is a doctrine that most people may not understand. Some people reject, but it is a doctrine nonetheless that we as Christians must believe. And that is the doctrine of original sin, the doctrine of original sin or the federal headship of Adam. You may even hear the term representation or representative. We have two particular persons that are described in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. In this particular passage we just read in verse 12 through 21, Paul is describing two kinds of people. One we just read is Adam. The other person is Jesus Christ. And both make up a representation of two groups of people. One redeemed, one lost. The one redeemed is through those who are represented by Jesus Christ. Those who are lost are represented by Adam. And through Adam, all of us are represented in that category, that all of us are lost. All of us are unsaved. All of us are under God's condemnation and under God's judgment. And apart from the saving grace of God, all of us would experience eternal death separated from the life of God. This is a very important topic. So I'm going to ask that you all, that you all have your thinking caps on because it's, we're going to go down deep. I'm going to make it as simple as I possibly can. But you're going to have to think with me. You're going to have to think with me because you're going to see yourself in this text. And hopefully you see yourself also in Christ. And this is why I titled it, 
in Adam, in Christ. In Adam, in Christ. In Adam, we're going to see three subheadings or three subpoints. And in Christ, we'll also see the latter three subpoints. And so I want us to understand, again, this is a very important doctrine. People that deny original sin are denying the very thing that God has saved them from. Their own sin. Yeah. People who deny original sin, who believe that man is not as bad as the Bible says that man is, are deceived. And there are many people who do not, who do not like to talk about sin, let alone how sinful man is. Sin is very deadly because sin sends everyone to hell. And you and I are sinners. But if you are in Christ, we are saints by calling. But before you are saints, you and I were sinners. We are of our forefather, Adam. Our forefather, Adam, who represents the entire human race, chose in the Garden of Eden to sin. And you may have heard this phrase where somebody may say, you're messing it up or ruining it for everybody. You ever heard anybody say that before? Maybe somebody said that to you. But it's true when it comes to Adam. What Adam did, he ruined it for all of us. And maybe one day when you see him, you can ask Adam, Dad, what were you thinking? What were you really thinking? What were you doing? Do you see what you did by taking of that fruit that the Lord told you not to touch, not to eat? Maybe we had that conversation with him in glory. But until then, we need to understand what Adam did and what Adam caused and how it affected the entire human race. So let's jump right in and begin. The first thing I want us to see about Adam is that in Adam, all sinned. In Adam, all of us sinned. Even though you say, well, wait a minute, hold up. How did I sin? I wasn't even there. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. I was there. You were there. All of us were there in Adam. And this is why Paul describes it in verses 12 to 14 and also in verse 19. Let's look in the text. It says, verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, who's that one man? Adam. Through that one man, Paul says, sin is entered into the world. Now, what does that presuppose? Prior to what Adam did, there was no sin in the human race. Prior to what Adam did in the garden, God created everything good. Everything was perfect. But when Adam chose to sin, that is when sin entered or invaded the world. And when I say it affected everything, it affected everything. Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and notice, and death through what? Is everybody reading it with me? And death through what? Death through sin. Thank you, class. He says, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to how many? All. All men. Why? Because... All sinned. Mm-hmm. All sinned. Every last one of us sinned in Adam. It didn't say sin, S I N. That means personal action or personal accountability. That means when you and I chose to sin, that's one thing. But it says S I N N E D. We sinned in Adam. Because what Adam did, we did in him. Look at verse 14. Excuse me, verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, which means credited, when there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, sin reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Notice, look at the progression of sin. Sin brings forth death, And in sin bringing forth death, it brings death even to those who didn't sin. Verse 19, go down there. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made what? Sinners. 
Sinners. Sinners. All because of what Adam did. Adam represent every human being on the planet. When Adam chose to sin, we sinned. Now, I already know what the objections are going to be because I can hear your mind clicking. But before you go there, hopefully your thinking will change when you hear the rest of the sermon this morning. Because some of you are saying, well, that's messed up. Why did Adam have to do that? I wouldn't have done that. Hold your thought on that. Because that challenges another thinking that needs to be thrown out of your mind. And I'll get to that in a moment. I want you to understand, though, what Adam did, you did. What Adam did, I did. Because we were in the loins of Adam when Adam chose to sin. Everything that we do is affected in some shape, form, or fashion by sin. We don't have a perfect, clear, clean thought process anymore. Because what Adam did, it affects how we think. It affects how we believe, how we behave, what we do. Everything has been affected by sin. Everything. When Adam chose to sin, we sinned in Adam. Again, look at at verse 13. It says, for until the law, sin was in the world. What is he talking about? What is Paul talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the Mosaic Law. Even before God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, before he gave him how man is to live and what man is to do and not do, Paul says sin was already in the world before the law was given. Now that should shake your thinking up for a second. Because when Adam sinned, there was no law. This is the realm now, or the dispensation, if you will, of the conscience. Adam didn't have a list of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this. All he had was one thing to do, one thing not to do. Out of all the trees in the garden, you may freely eat. But of this tree that is in the center of the garden, middle of the garden, you should not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? You shall surely die. You shall surely die. Sin brought forth death. It was never God's intention for man to die. Although God ordained and allowed for death to be a part of his overall plan so that he can send his son to redeem us from death. It was all a part of the plan. But when God created everything, the Bible says he created everything good. Adam didn't even understand what death was. Never had a concept about what death was because he never would have experienced death until he sinned. So in verse 14, nevertheless, he says, death reigned from Adam. Notice, notice, and death kind of like takes on a personification. It kind of takes on a personhood. Death reigned, death ruled over all humanity from the time of Adam's transgression to the time of the commandments given by God to Moses. Death reigned. People were dying even then. And he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned. And notice, in the likeness, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, Adam's sin was unique. And here's the reason why Adam's sin was unique, because Adam was the one that represented all humanity. There would would be no one else that would ever sin like Adam. Because Adam was the first person that God created. Adam represented everything. Every person that would ever live. And so when Adam sinned, Adam's sin brought transgression. And not only just transgression, but it brought the transmission of death to all humanity. So when Adam sinned, you sinned. I sinned. And this word sin is something that happened in the past and is completed now in the present. You and I were in Adam. You and I, before we were even thought of, were in Adam. Every person that is born on this planet is a sinner. If you don't think that people who are are born sinners, just look at babies. Hmm. Just, Just think about babies. Just think about, you don't have to teach a baby or a little child to sin. They sin automatically. Amen. And why do they sin automatically? Because their parents are sinners. And sinners beget its own kind. 
So when Adam sinned, we sinned. Now, I want to give you an example because this is in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8 through 10. You see an example of what I'm talking about and how this representation of a person is shown even in the writer to the Hebrews. And this is in the context of, of tithes, of tithing. It says, in this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, notice, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. Notice this. Levi wasn't even born yet. But Levi is under, or is one of the descendants of Abraham. And notice what the text says. Through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. Why? For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Do you see how this works? What Abraham did, Levi did, even though Levi was not even born yet. This is how the doctrine of original sin is shown and is taught or representation is shown. One person represents the whole. Adam represents all of humanity because all of us came from Adam, who was the first man. And his sin was unique. And since his sin was unique, verse 14 says, and the likeness of the offense of Adam. Notice it says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned. Notice in the likeness who had not sinned the same way that Adam sinned. Who is a type and how is Adam a type? Because Adam represents all of humanity, all of those who are fallen. But Adam also represents Christ in this context and only in this way. Because Adam represents those who are fallen. Christ represents those who are forgiven by faith and trust in him. Remember, there's two kinds of people who we're going to be talking about in this passage. Those who are in Adam, those who are in sin, those who are in Christ, who have been redeemed and saved. And again, all of us are in Adam. So in Adam, we see the first things that all sinned. But I don't understand that. I wasn't there. I just told you you were. And just shown you in Scripture that you were. The Bible says we were there. Again, verse 12, just for reiteration. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Not all sin, because we weren't there doing the very thing that Adam did, but we were there in that we are sinners because we sinned when Adam sinned, because Adam was our representative head. Now, let me make it even more practical for you. If you are the head of a household, if you are a father, or if you are a single parent, you represent your house. And what you do affects your house. Yeah. Did y'all hear me? Amen. Is anybody following that logic? Yeah. Amen. What you do as a husband or what you do as a single parent affects those children or people that are in that house. They had nothing to do with your decision. But when you mess up or when you do right or do wrong, it affects the whole. There are parents, there are husbands who walk out on their families and the children suffer because of the act of the one person in that house, the head. And this is why, again, we need to be very careful about what we say, what's not fair, and, and, and why did God allow Adam to, to be the one? Why he didn't make somebody else? Just hold your thought about that. Pump the brakes on that thought for just a second. We're going to get down that road in a minute. Because God chose and allowed Adam to sin for a purpose, but yet and still holds Adam responsible for the very thing that God ordained. Amen. Original sin, ultimately, is in the plan of God. Original sin, the fall, what Adam chose to do, what Adam caused was all a part of the plan, yet and still, God holds Adam and all of humanity responsible for their own sin. Because the Bible says, all sinned. 
in Adam. The second thing we see is also in this text. Not only in Adam all sin, but also in Adam all die. Again, verse 12, the B clause, it says, and so death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Verse 14 and 15, it says again, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned and the likeness of the offensive Adam, who was a type of of who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression for by the transgression of the one notice, the many died. By Adam's choice to sin, God is always true to his word, even though man may not be true to his word. God told Adam in the day that you eat of it, notice he says in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Dying you shall die. Literally is what it says. Adam, the moment that you eat of this of this fruit, you will start the process of death immediately. Now, let me show you how gracious and how good God is, because could not God had killed Adam when he ate of the fruit right then and there? Amen. Hello. Yes. Yes. Could he not have done that? But let me show you how gracious God is, even in the fall. Because if God were to have killed Adam, that would have been it for all of us. But yet God, in his grace, provided a substitute, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. But God is still true to his word, to his promise. He said, in the day that you eat of this tree that I told you not to eat, you shall surely die. And the process of death began Right at that moment. Immediately. Go down to verse 17. Notice what it says. It says, for if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. When Adam chose to sin, not only did he cause us to become sinners, but he also caused us to die because he, when he died, we died. And remember, sin is separation. Okay? Anytime there is sin, there is separation. And there's three kinds of separation. There's spiritual separation, there's physical separation, and then lastly, there's eternal separation. This is what sin brings. When Adam sinned, he experienced spiritual separation. He is no longer or is no longer in fellowship and in communion with God because he chose to sin. And that is with any relationship. When you and I sin, it causes relationships to break. The fellowship and the communion and the communication is broken or is stifled because there's a barrier. Between you and the other person. Well, ultimately, there's a barrier between you and God, between me and God when we sin. We sin in Adam, and now the barrier has been made. Remember, Adam was able to walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. Fellowship, constant fellowship, constant communication. Can you imagine having God just talk to you? And there's no barriers, no obstructions, no hindrances? But now the barrier is up. The walls are now up because you chose to be like God or desire to be like God. Because you chose to take the advice of someone else who's not God. This is what happened. Adam chose to sin. Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam chose to sin and Adam's choice caused you and I now to fall into sin and damnation. So in Adam, all die. Every last one of us. Walking dead people. In Adam. Although a person may be walking around alive and breathing, they're walking dead men. Because apart from Christ, apart from the last Adam, all die. In Adam. So spiritual death we see is a separation between God and man. The fellowship that God once had with mankind has now been broken because of what Adam chose to do. When Adam sinned, he caused all of us to be set away and pushed away and no longer be in fellowship and communion with God. That is spiritual 
separation, spiritual death. We see that in Genesis 3, 7 through 8. And then notice something here that's really key before we get to this passage. Y'all should all know the story about the fall, right? With Adam and Eve and what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Notice something that happened, though. When Eve ate of the fruit, nothing happened. Right? Why? Because Eve is not the federal head. Adam was. And once Adam ate of the fruit, then verse 7 and 8 says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. And it says they knew that they were naked. Stop right there. You didn't know that you were naked until you recognized that there was something, quote unquote, wrong with you. And see, this is what sin does. Sin now causes you to look at things opposite of what God has told you about what life is. And so you see here the eyes of both of them are now open. Now they understand. Now they see what's going on. And notice what they do. They see something wrong in each other. I didn't know you was naked. I didn't know you was naked. And notice what happened. And they, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covering. A husband and wife. Ashamed of being naked around the other person. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Wait a minute. Stop right there. You weren't hiding and running from God before sin. But that's what sin does. Sin causes you to run and hide and make excuses for sin. This is spiritual separation, spiritual death from God because of sin. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. How can you hide from omnipresence? You can't. But sin causes you to think that you can't run from God. Sin causes you to think that you can hide your sin from God. You can't hide your sin from God. God sees everything. And God knows everything. I want you to understand something. Prior to the fall, prior to sin, Adam and Eve had perfect fellowship and perfect communion with God. Prior to sin, there was no need for a covering of nakedness because the Bible says that they were naked and unashamed. Now, when sin comes into the picture, now they're naked and ashamed. See, when a, when a husband and wife, that is the most intimate relationship that God has created among two human beings. And when you find a husband and wife ashamed of their body and ashamed of being naked around the other person, that's because of sin. That's because of sin. Sin gives you that inferiority complex. Sin causes you to think that you're no longer fearfully, wonderfully made. Sin causes you to think that. Well, yeah, but, 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 but Eve didn't have no, no tummy like I got now. Well, that's not the point. The point is you are made in the image of God. And you are made in this likeness. And now what sin does, sin comes into the picture and causes you now to separate yourself from the very one that God has placed in your life. Sin only, only does that in relationship, but also sin does that in your relationship to God. They hide themselves from the presence of God. Among the trees of the garden, the very trees that God himself created, they want to hide from the very thing that God created. But also in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as an Adam, all die. Not making this stuff up. When Adam died, we died. When Adam separated himself from God because of his sin, he caused all of us to be separate. We are separated at birth. From God, spiritually speaking. Not only that, but in Ephesians 2 1, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I'm showing you how spiritual death is taught in Scripture. Dead in trespasses and sins. You are and I are separated from God if you and I are in Adam. Now, another interesting passage of Scripture. That you see how separation or spiritual death occurs because even Christ in Mark 15, 
was separated, separated from God the Father because of sin. Because of whose sin? Our sin. In Mark 15, 33 and 34, the Bible says, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Three hours of complete darkness. Sin is darkness. Three whole complete hours And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbatani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Do you see this? This is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, never had experience separating himself from the father because the three in one and the one in three had always been in fellowship until Calvary. And whatever happened on that cross, Christ experienced that. He wouldn't have said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me if he did not experience a separation between the father and the son? Spiritual death. Christ died spiritually in that moment. And that may get me in trouble by saying that, but I'm saying what the text said. When Christ took on the sins of all who would repent and believe in him, he took your sin, he took my sin, and that sin caused the son to be separated from the sovereign God of the universe. God the Father himself. Christ wasn't hallucinating when he said that on the cross. He understood and knew what it meant to be separated from the Father in fellowship with him because of our sin. He who knew no sin became what? Became sin for us. So we see spiritual death. When Adam chose to sin in the garden, he died spiritually immediately, right then and there. But not only that, he also died physically. Remember, sin brings forth death. So in Genesis 5, 5, the Bible says this. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So God wasn't lying. He said, yeah, when you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Now, when he ate of that tree, he probably didn't think he was going to die on the spot. I don't know. But eventually he died 930 years later. That's a long time. Methuselah is the oldest man who ever lived, 969 years. But Adam lived 930 years. And then you see the progression in how the, 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 the spreading of death affected even man's longevity. Yeah. Man ain't living 930 years. If you listen, if man lives 120, that's a good day. <laughs> And I'm talking about 120 years of good health. At the most, 110. I haven't seen anybody live 120 some years. That's because of sin. When God says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, the processes of death began. Man's lifespan started to deteriorate. But not only that, the most devastating and most damning form of spiritual death is eternal death. That is hell. That's Revelation 21 verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You notice the second death. You and I as believers, we escape the second death. Praise God. One person, two people. Can I get a third one? Yes. Can I get a fourth one? Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you are saved, the second death has no power over you. But if you are an Adam, you will experience the second death, eternal death, which is hell, the lake of fire, forever. There's no coming back from that. And this is what Adam did. Adam caused everyone to experience Death, spiritual death, physical death, eternal death, because in Adam all die. But not only that, not only did Adam all sin, but in Adam all die, but also in Adam all are guilty. Adam's guilt permeated and caused all of us to be guilty because we were in Adam. Look at verse 16, verse 18 and 19. Notice verse 16 says, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment, notice, arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. That's guilt. You're guilty. Verse 18. 
So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to how many? To all. To all men. All men are guilty because all men were in Adam when Adam was found guilty for his own sin. Verse 19. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. The many were made sinners because of what Adam did. Adam brought sin, he brought death, and he brought guilt to the entire human race. There is no one on this planet that does good because when Adam sinned, he made no one good. This is a bad picture, don't you think? Pretty bleak picture to know that anyone in Adam, there's no hope for you. If you are in Adam and you choose to stay in Adam because you think that, hey, I'm not as bad as the next person. Well, if you're comparing yourself to the next person, you probably won't be. But the standard of perfection is not the next person. The standard of perfection is Christ. So again, let me answer this objection for some who may be listening or some who may be in this room. Well, wait a minute. I wasn't there or I should be charged for what Adam did. Okay, hold that logic then. Because by that same logic, then you shouldn't be charged for what Christ did for you on your behalf then. If you want to carry that logic to its conclusion, well, it's not fair that I should be charged for what Adam did. Okay, then you should be charged for the righteousness that what Christ did for you on your behalf either. Now, which one do you want to be represented by? Do you want to be represented by Adam or do you want to be represented by Christ? The last one, the last Adam. Because there are a lot of people who will say, well, it's not fair. Well, first of all, you don't want fair. Amen. You want forgiveness. Amen. You don't want fair. You want mercy. You don't want fair because fair will cause all of us to fall. When I hear people say, well, that's not, I don't believe it's right. I don't believe it's fair. Well, wait a minute. Stop right there. Now you're questioning the omniscience and wisdom of God? Who, who are you? Who do you think you are to question how God does what he does with his own creation? He chose to use Adam to be our representative, just like he chose to use Christ to be our representative for those who are saved. So the logic makes no sense when you try to force that and think, OK, well, it's not fair over here for Adam to represent everybody because he caused everybody to fall into sin, into hell, into destruction. But then I'll take what Christ did over here. No, you're being you're being contradictory. God says, wait a minute. I am the Lord and I do all my good pleasure. So when people think this or have this attitude and mindset of saying, OK, well, I don't believe it's right. I don't believe it's fair. They don't know Bible. They have a human agenda or a humanistic view on what they think fair and what they think right is. As if God is going to bring you into the Trinity and have your view to trump everybody else's view in the Godhead. Have a seat. Several of them. Paul says, who has known the mind of the Lord in Romans 11, 34, that you should be his counselor? Who, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who do you think you are? To question what God does with his own creation. As if God owes you and I an explanation for why he calls things to happen the way that they're happening. And in fact, Wayne Grudem, he addresses this matter as well. Quote, he says, even though we must never say that God himself sinned or he is blamed or to be blamed for sin, yet we must also affirm that the God who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, the God who does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? And did ordain what sin would come into the world. Don't miss that. Do you know what the word ordain means? It means to cause to happen, to cause to come to pass, to plan it. It says, did ordain that sin would come into the world, even though he does not delight in it. And even though he ordained that it would come about through the voluntary choices of moral creatures. End quote. 
Now, if you can wrap your mind around that, then you can be the pastor because I can't. God ordained that sin be in the world and also holds man responsible and accountable and culpable for the very sin that he himself ordained and planned to happen in the world. This is why we should fall on our face right now and say, Lord, thank you. Your wisdom is so high above mine. Because I can't figure that one out. And that's why Paul even had to do that. Oh, the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You can't figure out God. Nope. So don't even try. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to get a headache doing that. You're going to hurt yourself. You can't figure out how God does what he does. All we can do is submit and bow the knee to what God's word says. And this is what he says. In Adam, all sin. In Adam, all died. In Adam, all are guilty. And we represent, and we are in Adam because Adam represents all of humanity. Not only that, number two, in Christ, here's the good news. In Christ, those of us who are in Christ, the Bible says, all are righteous in Christ. Not righteous in yourself, righteous in Christ. Because now the representative is Christ. Christ represents all those who are saved. And if you are in Christ, Christ is your representative. And thank God for that. Notice it says in verse 15 and 16. He says, but the free gift It's not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one the many died, notice, much more. It's greater, people. It's higher. It exceeds what Adam did. He says, much more did the grace of God, and notice, the gift is not a payment. It's not an obligation. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. He says, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, notice, abound to the many. Just like the many were sinners in Adam, the many are saved in Christ. By the grace and gift of God. Verse 16. He says, But on the other hand, to be clause, but on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. Notice, when Adam sinned, He caused all of us to sin. But after that, our sins, our transgressions, the text says, notice, results in our justification based on what Christ did for us. Are y'all getting this? Because Christ is our representative by faith and trust in him. Notice verse 19 and also verse 21. Notice verse 19, it says, for through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, notice how Paul, he takes up what God through Christ did higher than what Adam did. Even so, through the obedience of the one, that's Christ, the many will be made righteous. Notice, will be made. That's a promise. You and I can't make ourselves righteous. God has to make us righteous in Christ. Amen. And notice he says in verse 21, he says that as sin reigned in death, even so the grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through. Notice it's through Christ, through Christ, through Christ. Man has nothing to do with this through Christ, through Jesus Christ. Notice not Paul's Lord, our Lord, our Lord. This is good news. Because what Adam did, if you sandwich both of those together, if you just look at the, the outline, in Adam all sin, in Christ all are righteous. In Adam all die, but look at the second thing with Christ. All are innocent. All die, all are innocent. When Adam died, we died. When Adam sinned, we sinned. But what Christ did, now we take on the benefit and also the blessing of what Christ did. Because of one man's disobedient death reign, we fell in Adam because of what he did by disobeying God. But when Christ came and he obeyed everything that God required for him to do, we obeyed in Christ. 
Huh. Notice in verse 16, all are innocent. Well, wait a minute. But in Adam, all of us are guilty, right? Mm-hmm. But in Christ, all of us are innocent or justified, declared righteous, declared not guilty. You ever been to court before? Anybody ever been to court? If you've been to court and you know that you were guilty, the judge has the power to enact a penalty upon you based on his own decision. You ever heard somebody say, I plead upon the mercy of the court? He better. You can't come in there strolling into the court and somebody, like, look, I don't think I did it, and you trip me, and you give me what, what you call it, give me what I deserve. Now, I don't, I don't deserve this, this charge you try to give me. You don't come in there. You come on humble. You come nice. You come on time, finally. <laughs> you know, you, you yes, sir, and then no, sir, and you sound like a slave because you know what that judge has the power to do. So you plead upon the mercy of the court. Well, you and I stand before God, you better plead upon God's mercy. You don't plead upon your own righteousness. Mm. It's through Christ's righteousness. And God declares you and I innocent because of what Christ did on our behalf. Again, we're talking about representation. You don't want to represent yourself. And here's the thing again. You had no choice in the two either way. Either way it went. And so God allowed Adam's sin through how he has ordained all things and what Adam chose to do to affect all of humanity, what Christ did through his obedience and his willing choice to be obedient to the Father, and he even said, I do all things pleasing to my Father. What Christ did, we did in Christ. And all of us in Christ are declared innocent, no longer under guilt and shame. If you're walking around guilty as a Christian, you need to check and read the Gospels. You need to read and understand what Christ did on our behalf. There's no sense for a Christian to walk around in guilt if you've been declared innocent in Christ. The enemy brings guilt. The enemy brings condemnation. The Bible says, therefore, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because we've been declared innocent. We've been declared righteous. We're not falling under condemnation because now those who are of us who are in Christ are In him, he represents us. Verse 18, it says again, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness, notice, just one, just like it took one act of disobedience to cause all of us to fall, just one act of righteousness to call all of us to be made right with God. Because both represent, one represents disobedience, the other one represents obedience. One represents death, one represents life. One represents guilt, one represents innocence. He says again, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, if you think all men means every single person on the planet, you are a universalist. And universalism is not taught in Scripture. When it comes to salvation, just like Christ didn't die for every single person. He doesn't justify every single person. All men must be qualified based on his context. We got that. And how do we know that? Very simple. Because in verse 17, he says, for if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who what? Those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. It's those who receive. It's those who believe. It's those who trust that make up the all. All kinds of people. Yeah. Yeah. Not every single person. Because if every single person is justified, then there's nobody in hell. Right. And we know that can't be true. So notice what Paul is saying. Just like he uses the many to represent those who are in Adam, he uses the many to represent those who are in Christ. Just like he says, death spread to all men, he's representing those who are in Adam. All men, all those who are in Adam, all those who are in Christ are two different classes of people. The context determines the interpretation of the passage. 
All are innocent in Christ. That's the qualifier. If you're in Christ, you are innocent. It's not based on how you feel. It is based on what Christ has done for you and for me. But not only that, all are alive. And oh, by the way, you didn't make yourself alive. Just like you didn't make yourself to be born naturally. You had nothing to do with your natural birth. You have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. Come on, man. Make it plain. Your mother and father made a choice to bring you into this world. Your father of heaven and earth made a choice to bring you into this world through the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. You had nothing to do with either case. Amen. So then there's no reason for you to glory and boast in either case. Yep. It was the act of Adam that caused you to be in the position that you were in Adam, dead, a sinner, under the guilt and condemnation of sin. It was through the act of Christ which caused you and I now to be made righteous, to be made innocent, to be made alive in Christ. You had nothing to do with that. And this is why, again, free will is ridiculous to me because free will gives man glory and never gives God any glory. In Christ, all of us are alive, verse 17 and 18. He says again, For by the transgression of the one, death reigned. Death reigned. Death has power over those who are in Adam. Through the one. Much more through, or those, excuse me, who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in what? In life. <coughs> In life, Jesus said, I came that you may have what? Life. life. And that more abundantly, not just life, no, abundant life. Yeah. Yeah. And notice where the life comes from. Through the one, Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through you. It doesn't come through you praying a prayer and signing a card and walking an aisle. It comes only through Jesus Christ. Point blank period. Verse 18. So then it's through one transgression. There resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, if you want to stand before God in your own righteousness, go right ahead. I would not want to be you. If you want to play the fool and think that you can stand before a holy and righteous God in your own righteous deeds because you went to church or because you gave money to the homeless or because you did all these human things. Remember, I told you that everything that we do is affected by sin. Remember me telling you all that? You can see somebody do something nice, but you don't know what the motivation of their heart is. Well, no. yeah. And here's the thing. It may be a good thing that they do, but they're doing it in Adam. They're not doing it in Christ. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of people who give millions of dollars and give all kinds of help and assistance to people in this world that are going to hell. Yeah. And you know what? If you have a problem with what I just said, you need to repent. Because the Bible says all of our righteousness are as filthy rags in his sight. Yeah. That there's nothing that would make God want to save you because of something that you did. If anything, it makes him want to send us to hell because of what we did. It is only by the grace of God that you and I exist today. It is only by the grace of God that you and I exist in Christ. And the moment you and I think that we deserve more than what God has provided, you and I have placed ourselves on dangerous territory yeah. and on dangerous ground. Yeah. That's prideful to think that you deserve more than what God has given. Mm. When God has given you more than what you deserve. Come on. He's given us Christ. Amen. Freely. Listen, freely given us Christ. The abundance of God's grace has been bestowed upon you and I, and we sit here and act like salvation is no big thing. Salvation is a very big thing if you understand what Christ did on your behalf and on my behalf. Amen. 
This is why he talks about being alive in Christ. Because apart from being alive in Christ, people are breathing, walking dead men. They may have their blood pumping through their veins and their heart beating, but they're spiritually dead. And some of us look at people who got it going on, if you will, in this world, and you want to be like them, but you may not want to be like them if they're not in Christ. And why would you want to be like somebody else anyway? Be who God made you to be. Be yourself. But be yourself in Christ. This is all of us in Christ are alive. Let me read verse 18 again. He says, so then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification. Justification of life to all men. Look at verse 20. He says, and the law came in that the transgression might increase. But where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more. Do you know why God allowed the law and why he put the law in place? To show you and I how sinful man really is. That was the whole purpose of the law. It wasn't, it wasn't for you to try to meet it. You can't meet it. For the sinner, it shows us how sinful man can really be. That's why he says, thou shalt not. Because in man's heart, thou wants to do that. What God says, don't do. But for those who are righteous, it says, OK, Lord, I desire to do your will. I know I can't do this. I can't love my neighbor as myself. I can't love you with all my heart, soul, mind and strength in and of myself. But, Lord, I thank you for your law, because now you've given me at least something to look at. And aspire and ascribe and desire to do. Lord, I want to honor the Sabbath day. Lord, I don't want to just casually come into your house or casually worship you any kind of way. No, I want to revere you. Lord, I don't want to make any God of my own imagination, of my own thinking. Because you told me not to do that. Lord, I don't want to take anything that does not belong to me because you told me don't steal. Lord, I don't want to covet nobody's wife or nobody's car or nobody's job because you told me don't covet. Lord, I don't want to lie to get over because I may get over, but I'm not going to get away. Yeah. Because the word tells me to do that. So I delight to do your will, O oh God. I delight to obey your commandments. And only those who are in Christ can do that. Only those who are in Christ have a desire to be obedient to God's law. So the law has two purposes. It's a twofold purpose. For the sinner, it shows them how sinful they are. For the saint, it provides a, 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 a guide, a standard by which we are to live by. Where are you getting this from? When we get to chapter 7, you'll see it. Quickly, let's go to verse, verse 7 in chapter 7 of Romans. Notice what he says. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Hmm. Is the law sinful? May it never be. The strongest word in the Greek language. May it never be. Absolutely not. On the contrary. Notice what Paul says. I would have not know, have come to know sin except through what? Except through the law. I didn't know what sin was until God says, oh, hey, don't do this. Right. Don't do that. Don't say this. Don't do that. Don't think this way. I would not have known that. Paul said until God had brought the law. Notice he says, he says, for I would not have known about coveting. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. A covenant, what is that? <laughs> Notice he said in verse 8. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. It wasn't until I read the 10th commandment that I said, ooh. Mm. The law brings something in you. He brings it out of you, what's already in you. I, I would not have known what children be obedient to your parent, honor thy father and mother until you said Honor thy father and mother so that your days may be long upon the earth. And now you place in a situation where you got to be tested in your honoring and obedience to your parents. The law shows us how sinful the heart really is. But in verse 12 in chapter 7, Paul says this. He says, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. The law is good because it comes from a good God. The law is holy because it comes from a holy God. The law is right because it comes from a righteous God. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's the recipients of the law that something is wrong with them. So 
two kinds of people. In Adam, in Christ. And the same is true for us. In our lives, there are two kinds of people that represent us. Which one represents you? Which brings us to our one point of application. There are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who are fallen, those who are forgiven. When you are engaging people in this world, you are either engaging those who are fallen in Adam or those who are forgiven in Christ. Are y'all getting that? Amen. First Corinthians 15, 22, the Bible says this, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Spiritual death, spiritual life. When you go to your job, or when you go to school, when you're walking around, when you see people out in the neighborhood, listen, when I drive home, from work, I know I'm sharing the road with somebody either has fallen or forgiven. And depending on how they drive, you can probably tell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just joking. But I'm saying how you and I ought to see life. We need to see life through those kinds of lens. I'm looking either at a fallen person or a person who's forgiven in Christ. Because that's the only, that's the only kind of races of people we get. A fallen race. And a forgiven race. And you know, you know, here's another thing. Heaven is only going to be filled with those who are forgiven. Heaven will not be a place occupied for those who are fallen. Otherwise, there's no need to be in heaven. In Christ, there's freedom in Christ. In Christ, there's life in Christ. In Christ, there's innocence and there's justification and there's peace in Christ. Why would you or I want to trade that for anything else in the world? Because in Christ, those who are in him have newness of life. Those who are in Adam think they may have life, but they're walking in death. And so our job should be to rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Telling people who you and I see every day, praying and asking God for opportunities, Lord, help me to be a help to someone else to know that their state, if it is not in Christ, it is in Adam. And it's not going to be this cookie-cutter approach. Please don't ask me, well, Pastor, you know, how, how should I go about doing this? Well, it depends on the situation. It depends on the individual that you are engaging. There's no cookie-cutter way to get a person saved other than Jesus. That's it. And then you pray and ask God through the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom an understanding on when to engage them about this man named Jesus. And I guarantee you, he would do it for you. He says, no good thing would he withhold for those who rightly fear him. And if you are in Christ and you fear him, I guarantee you, God is a savior by nature. And he wants to save those that he chooses to save for his glory. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Seal it to our hearts this morning. Help us, Lord, to understand again. That in Adam all die. We once were in Adam, but now we are in Christ and we rejoice in our salvation. We do not take any glory or any boasting in our own work because it was not through our own works that saved us. It was only through the finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross. And so, Lord, we thank you. We love you for Jesus Christ. We thank you and love you for what you sent your son to do. On our behalf, because we were helpless and we were hopeless without Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you that we are in Christ and no longer in Adam. But, Lord, not just that we are not in in Adam, but we are in Christ. But, Father, we want others to be transferred from that fallen race of Adam and be placed into the forgiving race of Jesus Christ. Do it for us, Lord, and give us opportunities, O God, to make your son's name great. This we ask in Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the His Word, His Way broadcast. Our ministry is supported by your prayers and financial gifts to help spread the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On behalf of the His Word, His Way family, thank you for supporting our ministry with your prayers and financial gifts. And remember, the Word of God is the final authority. Make it yours. God bless you.